born in New Zealand and ordained a priesthood in Australia, thereafter joining the Society for the Sacred Mission, he arrived in Durban's apartheid South Africa in 1973, where he became a chaplain for both white and black students. He realized the inequalities, injustices, and brutalities the blacks experienced from their white counterparts and the regime of the day. He used these positions to speak out on behalf of these people. Following the Soweto uprising that left hundreds of children dead, Father Lapsley was expelled from the country, winding up in the neighboring country of Lesotho, where he joined the ANC as a chaplain in exile. He moved to Zimbabwe in 1982, where he continued his work fighting against the apartheid regime. He was placed on the hit list. Sadly, only three months after Nelson Mandela's release from prison, Father Michael Apsley received a puzzle bomb that blew both his hands and an eye. He was moved to Australia for treatment. Upon his return to South Africa, he headed the Trauma Centre for Victims of Violence and Torture in Cape Town. The Institute of Healing of Memories was also established thereafter. Today, Father Michael Apsley is in America, where he has been holding a lot of speaking engagements and book signing for his book, Redeeming the Past, my journey from freedom fighter to healer. Father Michael Apsley, welcome to Sahara TV. Thanks, Funkai. Great to be with you and to be with all the viewers, wherever they may be. Okay. Now, I'm just going to start off by asking, what is healing? Hmm. Well, I suppose the word healing implies that in some ways, as human beings in our life journey, we get damaged. Right. And so where there's damage, there needs to be uh, a way of repairing the damage. And that is what we call healing. Um, but of course, my own particular work is in the healing of memories. And, 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 and that is about the journey of coming to terms with the things that have happened to us, finding the way of getting out the poison inside of us, is a consequence of the things that have happened to us. And when I say poison, I mean things like hatred and bitterness and desire for revenge. And then as we heal, we begin to be able to integrate what has happened to us so that we continue to remember, but we, when we remember we're not filled with anger, we are at peace. Right. Uh, in, in ourselves with the things that have happened to us. And I mean, I can say this in a couple of sentences, but for some people, this can be even the journey of decades of uh, finding that, that uh, inner peace where the past is not buried, uh, but rather truly healed. Okay, now in your situation, you're obviously a victim of a system, an evil system of the day in South Africa, where you were on a hit list. Now, how do you then forgive a system? Because then maybe it has no face, it has no name. Uh, I mean, well, I think we need to distinguish between uh, healing of memories and forgiveness. Right. So when horrible things have happened to us, the, there needs to be this journey of coming to terms with what happened. Because if we don't, we remain victims forever. As I, as I said myself, if I was filled with hatred and bitterness and desire for revenge, they would have failed to kill the body, but they would have killed the, sto killed the soul. Um, but forgiveness is another question altogether. Um, because while it was a system, uh, there were people who made the bomb that was supposed to kill me, who wrote my name on an envelope. Right. Uh, there was a chain of command. And so there can be a question of forgiveness for them. I say can be, because in my case, I don't actually know uh, who made the bomb, who gave the orders, who wrote my name on the envelope. So for me, forgiveness is not yet on the table. Uh, but were someone to come and knock on my door and say, will you forgive me? then forgiveness is on the table. Uh, then I've got to decide how I respond. What, yeah, I was going to ask you, what would your reaction be and say somebody came and say, right. my name is, maybe you know them. Yeah, well, um, it, of course it's a speculative question. 
and, and so I, I can think about it in my mind, but if the person was actually at the door and we're two human beings, I'm not sure fully how I would respond. But I might say, excuse me, sir, do you still make letter bombs? And, right. and, and <laughs> as an opening, opening line. Right. Uh, maybe the person says, no, well, actually, I, I, I work around the corner from you at the children's hospital. Will you forgive me? I think I, I have no, no doubt that my response would be, yes, of course I forgive you. But I would prefer that you spend the next 50 years working in that hospital rather than be locked up in prison because I believe a thousand times more in the justice of restoration than the justice of punishment. So often we say justice, we mean um, punishment if not revenge, but there's another kind of justice, the justice of restoring relationships. So, you know, I, 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 I've forgiven, we sit down, we drink tea together, I say, but my friend, um, I've forgiven you, but I still have no hands. My, I still only have one eye, my, my eardrums are still damaged. I still live with the consequences of what you did. I'll always need someone to assist me for the rest of my life. Of course you'll help pay for that person, not as a condition of forgiveness, but as part of reparation and restitution. But I, I would also want to add from Guy that, that I think for many human beings across the planet, forgiveness is the big one. Uh, forgiveness can be the key, the gateway to healing. But particularly in faith communities, because forgiveness is talked about a great deal, we give the impression that it's something glib and cheap and easy. Most human beings, for most human beings, it's costly, it's painful, it's difficult. Um, and, and I think sometimes in terms of faith traditions, people need the actual the power right. that comes from God to even to want to want to forgive. Because sometimes we don't want to. Sometimes we want to hold on. Some people say, give me time. Give me time. So because in the time, time a healer? Well, it, it may be. Um, time is sometimes a healer because time sometimes provides the space where gradually we work through what we have inside of us. And, 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 and the time becomes like a constant mirror in which we look into ourselves. But I say not necessarily as well, because sometimes people simply bury the past rather than heal it. And if you bury something that's filled with poison, it continues underground in a subterranean way to damage and to uh, destroy. And, and we know there are conflicts in the world that have lasted for centuries. And time hasn't healed because the memory is still filled with poison. Uh, and, and sometimes grandparents tell their grandchildren stories and they say, don't you ever trust them because of what, we, what they did to us. So, so the poison lies not on what we think about the past, but in what we feel about the past, right. which is why in our healing work, we want to give pace, space for people to, think, to speak about how they feel. And it's important that we don't say, you're wrong to feel that way. It's normal if horrible things have been done to you or your loved one. It's normal to hate, it's normal to be bitter, it's normal to want revenge. Those, those are human emotions. The problem is, if we keep them inside of us, in the end, they don't destroy our enemies, they destroy us. So it's, it's, it's a question of discovering, how do I find freedom? How do I find peace for myself right. in order that I may be free to go on living my life? So now you're in the country when um, the Boston bombing happened. And uh, I can't help but feel for the people that obviously lost their lives and some that lost their limbs. Uh, you know, there were a couple of them. There's a particular lady who's a dancer. Her name is Adrian, and Adrian Halsett. She lost uh, one uh, leg. So I know the process of loss. There's a process in which somebody has to go through, which involves grief, anger, you know, bargaining, and all mm, that. Mm. So. What's the most difficult stage out of that? I think we're all different. And I think when it comes to loss, human beings don't respond according to an automatic pattern. I mean, the things you refer to of how um, there are things we know about uh, the journey of grief and loss that people travel, but it's not always in the same order. and It doesn't always take the same length of time. But I think if you've lost a limb, um, it's like you've lost a loved one. And right. if, if, if the most important person in your life dies, 
you will always grieve for that person. It doesn't mean that you will necessarily be forever consumed or paralyzed, but it does mean that grief will be part of your life. And that's true for me. So I will always grieve for the hands that I've lost. So that's part of who I am. But that doesn't mean that, it, that I'm not able to get on with my life. Um, and I think sometimes we too, too quickly and glibly say to people, just move on, just get over it. Um, well, that's a journey and it can be a very long journey. It can be the journey of many years. Of course, it is true that people can also get stuck uh, in their grief and their loss and they become paralyzed forever and sometimes that's when they have an opportunity to speak about their pain and to be heard in a respectful reverent way in a, sa in a safe place that that's when they can perhaps begin to let it rest not forget what happened but begin to again be at peace with that and and I realized that she did a, quite a good thing she actually came out to watch uh, Dancing with the Stars because she's a dancer and she claims that every day she used to dance until obviously she lost her limbs. So she came out. So is that part of healing? I think what well, is. I think go the, ahead with life? of course. Yeah, I mean, I think each individual has to find their own their own way, and 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 it's not so much that other people should prescribe to her or to anyone else. This is what you should do, but that others are prepared to be there, encouraging and supporting but giving people the space and the time they need. And even the strongest people, they also need the space to be vulnerable. Right. Uh, we also need permission to cry. Um, you know, there's a poster that I still want to get printed that says, real men cry. Mm -hmm. uh, because often in society, uh, women are given permission to cry, but men are not in some cultures, in some societies. Right. But human beings cry, so we don't cry outside. Cry we cry outside inside so we need we need that space to 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 work through and also even the space to be sad and sorry for myself i mean you know my experience um i had immense prayer love support from all over the world when i was bombed right. but there were days that i thought perhaps it'd be better to be dead because is life going to be life what's life with, with no hands I, i'd never met anyone with no hands so i couldn't imagine what it would be like um but that was a little bit of the time uh, most of the time I was able to focus on saying, for me, the struggle now is the struggle to get well, the struggle to return, the struggle to live my life as fully, as joyfully, as completely as possible. And that will be my victory. And I'm sure uh, some of the people who have lost limbs um, in, in Boston, each of their journeys will be unique and particular. But it's as they begin to see, actually, there are possibilities. I mean, in a sense, for me, while I have permanent major loss, it has also equipped me further to do the kind of work that I do. Um, I have a further qualification, and many people who end up in helping professions right. do it because of how they've managed to deal with the things that have happened to them. So, so uh, in a way, it, yeah, it speaks to the kind of the, the title of my book, Redeeming the Past bringing life out of death, good out of evil. But I think it's important to say it's not a journey of now, five minutes. It may be a, a long journey over a lot of time. Yeah. Now, going back to the Boston bombings, uh, one of the bombers was killed when, uh, of course, they exchanged gunfire between the police and him. So there was problems with how and where he would be buried, and most of the cemeteries in Boston were not even wanting his body there. So do you think this is part of a traumatized society? This is the response and reaction to that? I think it can be, but I think it also illustrates where sometimes the people at some remove from an incident sometimes take harder lines or harder positions than those who are closed. Sometimes the relatives of the victims find it harder to heal than those who are the direct survivors. Now, anything which is uh, life-threatening will be life-changing, but it will either cause us to grow or to diminish. Right. Uh, and we all have a shadow side of us. Uh, we all have uh, a, a side of us which has destructive um, feelings there. Uh, and, 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 and 
the wider society can either encourage those feelings and respond in hatred and revenge, or equally into sort of huge stereotyping. I mean, it's, you know, the obvious thing is that um, when uh, terrible things are done by white people who are Christians, we don't say, oh, that was done by a white Christian. Uh, but when it's done by someone who is of the Islamic faith, we say, that was done by a Muslim. And then we generalize uh, a stereotype to the, to the huge group. But, but I'm coming back to the point that, that the individual who has survived often has uh, the choice to be generous where, and, and I mean, I think it's, it's tragic right. that the society can't say, but the person was a human being and they should be mm -hmm. given a decent burial with dignity. Because otherwise, if we respond in a totally horrendous way, are we different? From the very people who who who, who have Call, done who have yeah. done terrible things, and that's the danger. Because equally, there have been voices in the United States saying this justifies torture. Um, you, you start justifying the taking away of fundamental human rights that are the cornerstone right. of a civilized human society, and you become no different from those you say you're against. So you worked under the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of course, in the Department of uh, Healing. Uh, do you believe that sometimes there cannot be healing without peace? What, what, what do you mean by that? Because I'm kind of When you say there cannot be healing without peace, what is it you're having in mind? Okay, what I'm trying to say is um, there are certain countries, obviously, that are going through or have gone through certain uh, traumatic and... Okay, I see what know, you're saying. I, I, I think that... Problematic times, so... Sure. When there's no stability, there's no peace, That's is true. that a time for to start the healing well, process? You know, there's the, the famous uh, passage in the, 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 the everybody has heard from the book of Ecclesiastes, there's a time for war, there's a time for peace, there's a time for fighting, there's a time for breaking down. Um, if you had said to the people of South Africa in the middle of the 1980s, the time has come for healing, right. you would say, dream on. Uh, there was still a monster that needed to be slain. Um, but the day came when we achieved democracy, and the time had come for healing. But I want to speak out both sides of my mouth and say this that it's incredibly important that there are some, particularly among leaders, who have dealt with their own stuff before that peace comes. I mean, imagine in the context of South Africa, if Nelson Mandela had walked from prison after 27 years and said, it's time to get them, we would have died in our millions. Uh, but instead, he comes out and says, Never, never, and never again should people do to one another what was done to us. So clearly, there was, even in his incarceration, there had been a process, a of, process of ongoing process of understanding why it was that he was suffering, uh, so that he came out, as did many of our leaders, without a trace of hatred or bitterness. So then they became the moral giants to help lead the nation forward. So while it's true that it is when there's peace, that is the time for healing. There needs also to be some people who are still dealing with their stuff, even as the conflict uh, continues, who can then help the society uh, as a whole uh, move forward. Okay, so now we'll talk about, I mean, basically what we've been talking about is really about your book and the work that you've been doing, but specifically in this, uh, these are um, your memoirs, right? You are trying to teach people on the process of healing. Well, in a sense, um, redeeming the past, it, it is, is the story of my life, but it's also the story of the founding of the Institute for Healing of Memories. Um, but I've lived long enough that I've met many extraordinary human beings across the planet who have taught me many lessons. Mm -hmm. So yes, there is a teaching to this book, but it's a wisdom that I have gained from others in my journey of healing. The book throughout, from beginning to end, speaks to the collective character of healing, which of course is, um, fits so beautifully with the African philosophical tradition. Right. You know, a person is a person through other people. I am because you are. The whole concept of Ubuntu, 
which is about the interconnectedness of human beings. So uh, in my case, you know, I'm the fifth of seven children. I joined a community of brothers and priests. Um, I joined the liberation struggle. I recognized that the individual would not end apartheid. It would be, it would be by people working in a disciplined way, collectively. Um, and in the work of the Institute for Healing of Memories, we don't do one-on-one -on -one work. We create sacred, what we call sacred and safe spaces where people can sit in a circle, six, seven, eight people at a time, each person telling their story, one at a time, other people listening to their stories. And it's in the process of talking and listening around the circle that people begin to feel connected through the sharing of pain and, and being able to let go of that which has uh, damaged them or destroyed them. So the book give, gives witness to that. In the second part of the book, um, there are the voices of people that we have worked with across the world, in Northern Ireland, in South Africa, in Uganda, in Haiti, in Colombia, indigenous people in the center of Australia. Their voices are all here in the book, right. giving witness that in the end, we are one human family. Um, uh, yes, context and history and, uh, can be very unique and very different, but at the deepest level, as human beings, we're capable of the most terrible things, and we're also capable of being people of kindness, gentleness, and, and compassion. So, and it's interesting, many people have read this book already, said when they read it, it was like a mirror, where people, as they read it, not that, not that everyone who reads it has lost their hands, right. but in the, in the story, they were able to look at themselves and look at their own journey. And in the end, I hope, be encouraged and inspired on, the, on their own journey to healing. So I know throughout the world, there are people that obviously uh, need that healing, you know. And uh, like you're, you're saying, in the format in which you do it, you gather a group of people, which is almost like people who have suffered in a similar way. So is it possible for people to heal, let's say if you suffered in Africa, to go through that healing process in a different setting, in a different country, different country? Yes, I think healing is for everybody everywhere. And, and it's, we've just had a workshop here in New York last week. Um, and there were people from incredibly different backgrounds, uh, but it was their pain that connected them. Right. So, so you can be with people who have had similar experiences. You can even be with people who have been on the other side of the conflict. Uh, and in the telling of the stories, people begin to see there's not simply an us and a them, but actually we, we are all us. So, you know, for example, in a context of, of, of uh, Southern Africa, um, a, a black mother uh, comes and tells her story and tells the story of uh, a son who went away to war who never came back. Uh, right. and, and the white mother says, well, my son came back, but he's damaged forever. And suddenly there are two mothers and they're connected by the sharing of pain and the pain is transcended. It's not to say that their reality is the same, but there's a human connection yeah. in which they can then be supporters to, to each other on, on journeys to healing. Okay. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, that was a very encouraging and uh, informative discussion. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. Indeed. Okay. Now, where can people find this book? Is it online? Amazon? Barnes and yes. Uh, it's, it's published by Orbis. They can either look at orbis.com mm -hmm. um, or they can go on Amazon. Uh, dot com and they can find it there. Um, so yes, it's it's readily available uh, online, and also there's an e-edition available uh, as well. Um, and one would hope all good bookshops would okay. would have copies as well. But it can also be ordered that way. It's a good word. It's a good book. So I'm sure all good book uh, good. Uh, Bookshops are going to obviously. And people could also, if they're interested in healing of memories, look at our website. Healing, if they just Google healing of memories, they'll find the Institute for Healing of Memories, healing memories.org, and right. they could learn more about our work and be in contact with us, either in the United States or in South Africa. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, viewers. That was Father Michael Lapsley from South Africa, and he was talking about his work. 
and uh, also the release of his new book, Redeeming the Past, My Journey from Freedom Fighter to Healer. In fact, I was going to change that part to say, My Journey from Priesthood, Freedom Fighter <laughs> to Healer. <laughs> anyway, thank you. We'll join you in the next half. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.